Uh, welcome everybody to this webinar of Discover Us. Uh, first of all, um, we are recording this uh, this video. So uh, uh, today uh, we are having we are hosting this uh, fourth webinar of the Discover Us uh, project. You know the Discover Us initiative uh, is a great collaboration between uh, Europe and the uh, United States uh, research institution focusing on distributed computing, uh, computing continuums, warm intelligence, and artificial intelligence. Uh, artificial intelligence. So um, uh, with this uh, webinar, uh, we aim at uh, disseminate the results of the, of the research at both sides uh, of the, this partnership. So today we are very uh, happy to have uh, Pete Beckman uh, from Argon. So uh, Pete is a widely recognized expert in uh, distributed uh, computing and architecture for uh, large scale parallel uh, distributed computing system. Uh, he, is, he is leading the Argo project uh, in, uh, in Argon. He's also founder of the uh, Weigel uh, project for artificial intelligence and edge computing at, uh, at Argon. And uh, he uh, uh, co co directs the Northwest University Argonne Institutes uh, for Science and Engineering and leads the uh, SAGE uh, project funded by NFS uh, to build this uh, AI at uh, the edge to support uh, the uh, ecological research for the National Ecological Observatory Network and urban research of, <clears throat> for the array of things. So um, the young this age project I think that Pete will explain us is to design and build a new um, kind of national level reusable cyber infrastructure and enable artificial intelligence at at the edge. So um, you can uh, write your question in the Q and A or here in Zoom. Uh, you can also write in the chat, but it's better to use the proper section. So Pete, welcome. Uh, very happy to have you here. Uh, please, you can start at your convenience. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I really appreciate the uh, both the introduction and the opportunity to speak here. We've been collaborating with people in Europe as we've been exploring these ideas uh, for now. You know, more than five or six years, the collaboration, um, and with in in an informal way. And with the Discover US program, we're very excited that we can, you know, maybe push forward a little bit more and do uh, dig deeper and collaborate more uh, on topics and uh, are looking forward to um, having more students and, uh, of course, connecting and, and visiting. So uh, um, I'll also make one other quick uh, note is that I've worked at Argonne uh, um, for 22 years, uh, but I've also been uh, working at Northwestern University for the last 12 years. And starting July 1st, I'll be at Northwestern, uh, which is the, the, the thing up there, uh, and, uh, and not at Argonne. So uh, we're do, we have joint appointments often, and so I'll be moving from Argonne to Northwestern, and I will be leading the SAGE project, continuing. And in fact, I'm re moving to, to Northwestern because uh, uh, SAGE is an NSF project, and it's really exciting, and it's the central part of my, uh, my work now. So um, I'll start with uh, just uh, sharing my screen and... Uh, a uh, and the a presentation and I realize we have about an hour so I'm going to go through some of this a little quickly and uh, then hopefully have time for discussion because these topics are really evolving fast um, and so uh, that's I'm really interested in talking about that so you know when we think about AI uh, um, most of the time people are imagining AI in the machine room is really big, massive, massive cloud machine like, you know, OpenAI and others, uh, Gemini and uh, Mistral and where you're talking, you're chatting, you're using a big AI server. But actually, AI is being pushed and moved all the way down to the edge. And for the last 10 years, um, it's amazing now that it seems it's that long, but it is. We've been working on how to bring that software and those discoveries of AI down to the edge. So this picture here, it shows a environmental monitoring station 
uh, in a project at the uh, National Science Foundation called NEON. And these uh, towers measure uh, environmental uh, components, uh, carbon dioxide, um, uh, the carbon flux, uh, temperature, pressure, humidity. But in that little uh, uh, box in the middle is a instrument hut uh, where there's computing racks. And so we can move the computation out to all over the United States or Europe or other places doing computation there. And we've done that as part of the SAGE project. And I'll talk about what that computation looks like in just a moment. But the idea is that, yes, there is still supercomputing, not to worry. There's big exascale platforms and post exascale platforms and uh, platforms at Barcelona, platforms in Ulich, uh, platforms in Stuttgart, right, in Munich. But there's also AI that has moved out uh, all over and is programmable, and scientists can can write AI codes for that. And so uh, here are some examples of that just deployed in the United States, uh, whether it's a small instrument hut in Colorado or looking at wildfire in Oregon, or that uh, on the right-hand side is a tower I'll talk about in Illinois. It's solar powered and uh, um, and goes up and can measure uh, biodiversity. And on the left is one that's planned, if you know that uh, a very sad set of events in the United States where a wildfire destroyed, largely destroyed a, a town in uh, uh, Hawaii called uh, Lahaina. And uh, so we have been there and we'll put up a node which we can use to uh, understand and use algorithms to understand the recovery process there. So what does this mean, this running AI at the edge? Well, uh, we have all of these kinds of instruments, uh, you know, from big, massive telescopes, uh, even like the Vera Rubin telescope in, in Chile, um, to little IoT devices. And they don't all just send their data to the cloud, but processing that data at its source means that you can analyze the full resolution. Sometimes people ask us, well, why not just send it all to the cloud? Well we can't. The amount of data that you can collect at the edge is way more than you can collect and send to the cloud. And a simple, uh, you know, uh, a example of this would be, you know, if you imagine the future of self-driving cars, uh, those cars have to make autonomous decisions about the data. They're not taking a picture of uh, the traffic and sending it to a server in some other place and deciding, should I move into the left lane or the right lane? Those decisions are made locally because there's so much data and it has to be processed immediately. So that's what we mean when we're talking about edge computing and across this continuum. Yes, there are the supercomputer centers, but there's AI pushed out to the edge. And uh, Sage is a project to make that kind of software possible and to provide it free as open source to everyone. And uh, that's what's currently available. And you can, if you go to the sagecontinuum.org website, you can get a tutorial and download and look at the source code and run it on an x86 or an ARM platform and, uh, and start doing AI at the edge. Now, what are the kinds of things you might do with this capability? Well, everything from analyzing traffic or wildlife or smoke or floods uh, or plant species or bird species, it's all running a piece of software inside the device at the edge. In this case, uh, you see in this picture, a node which we called a wild sage node, meaning it's out in the wild, it's outside. Uh, it has a couple cameras and a microphone. It can be hooked to LIDAR, to micro pulse radar. It can be hooked to lots of different uh, devices. We have one group that hooked it to a sap flow meter that measures sap, tree sap going up and down uh, a tree. Uh, so anything that is an instrument that you can put and we put computing in it is where this this uh, uh, concept can, can live. And so there's a sophisticated software stack that supports this kind of model. Um, there's a, a quote unquote job scheduler, which runs these containers at the edge. Uh, it's built on all standard uh, tools. So Kubernetes, uh, containers, uh, things like um, OpenCV and TensorFlow and PyTorch. 
And all of those components are brought together into a unified software infrastructure that allows you to run something on an edge device. And uh, as I mentioned, we have those spread across the country. And that first part of the project completed in February, and now we're working on a second part of that project. Uh, and we have 127 nodes. Uh, we just deployed some in, uh, in Hawaii, which I'll mention. Uh, and uh, we already have about 100 uh, terabytes of data and uh, are fast approaching sort of a petabyte, um, actually. So um, these uh, processing elements which which link instrumentation and processing together are being used all over for different kinds of science. So I mentioned the kind, you know, what you might do with it. You might write a code that analyzes clouds or, or analyzes uh, uh, biodiversity, but people are deploying it at little universities. So this is a uh, front page article in the Chicago newspaper some time ago um, uh, explaining how and now they're using the term weather sensors, um, but uh, how computing at the edge, and this is, you can see down here at the bottom left, one of these nodes, how computing at the edge can process data and use it to understand climate change in an urban environment. And uh, this is the kind of thing that students can get very excited about because it's hands-on. Um, they're actually, you know, deploying these on roofs uh, of buildings or uh, um, uh, in downtown at small universities, and uh, they're pretty easy to do. Now, we are not um, uh, designers of sensors. We just happen to plug anything that someone brings into a GPU so that we can compute and use AI. So um, people sometimes ask us, um, well, what kind of sensors do you have? Well, anything that you can connect, right? So as I said, some people have connected a SAP flow meter, other people a hyperspectral camera or a uh, LIDAR, and we'll talk about those examples. But remember, we're the computing group, but we connect our computing to instruments so that we can observe uh, with AI the world, right? And write these kinds of new programs. Uh, we recently deployed in our first national park. Um, so then this is in the United States in Hawaii. Uh, we had four students who uh, uh, deployed a couple sage nodes uh, in the Volcanoes National Park. And those students, you know, learned both the AI algorithm. Some of them had written code for this node. And then, of course, the uh, actual uh, understanding of how to do this kind of electronic instrumentation. Um, now I'm going to just mention... Um, uh, two pages showing, you know, what real students and postdocs and scientists, what they really do. How do they actually write code uh, that lives at the edge? So up here in the left is Bupendra, and he is an atmospheric scientist. So he wrote code that calculates what's called cloud motion vectors, right? You can look up with a camera and calculate where the cloud is moving and how, and only send that data back only send the how the clouds are moving. You don't have to send frames, right? So you're sending the results. Uh, this is a student who worked on understanding ride share by identifying these stickers, uh, which uh, are required in Chicago. Uh, Bobby is an atmospheric scientist who worked on connecting a LIDAR, and I'll, I'll mention that later, um, so that you can autonomously steer the LIDAR based on um, wind turbulence. Uh, Dario was doing biodiversity measurements uh, with birdsong. Uh, uh, Alex is a student, uh, was working on snow coverage, ca automatically calculating snow coverage. Jacob working on wildfire. Um, uh, Alex working on uh, understanding models for uh, predicting solar irradiance for solar panels, uh, measuring uh, uh, um, traffic. Uh, measuring water and water depth, flooding. Um, so all of these are examples of people, students, postdocs, others, writing code that lives in the device at the edge. Now, when those codes are written, they go into what we call the edge code repository. You can think of it as kind of like an app store, uh, because if you write a piece of code that does something like measures the traffic state, then you wanna make that available to the whole community. 
and say, hey, if you have a, a Sage-based node that runs the Kubernetes Sage software stack and has all the security credentials, then you can run, you can schedule a job to run that traffic state estimator out on the edge. So we put all of those into this uh, repository. So students and every, everyone is open source. You can, and if you were to go to this repository today and click on this, uh, you would get a link. It shows what the science is. And then you can click that link and it takes you to the GitHub page where you can download the source, right? So everything is ready for students uh, and others to start in and actually use by writing their own code. Now, I'm going to give an example of the transformation that's happening. And this is where it gets maybe uh, uh, both excited and complicated and new and uh and but that's exactly why we're in science we're in science because it's disruptive and everything you do becomes obsolete the you know soon and uh and that's exactly what we want that's the that's the exciting part so what you see here um uh is that we uh several years ago well, you know started but uh, in in 2023 the i would say the state of the art in wildfire, of course, uh, we know that parts of Southern Europe, of course, have a significant problem with this. But you know, in the U.S., it's it's a it's a very very uh, dangerous and difficult problem because of climate change. And even today, you know, in the news, there are already some some days that are uh, over a hundred degrees Fahrenheit for us, um, and that's extraordinarily hot. And in the West. Uh, the trees are already baking dry, and so this is this is a dangerous thing. So, um, a year and a half, two years ago, all the work was on what I'll say is a bespoke, a custom AI model where images uh, like this were were curated by humans. Humans would then look at images and say, I think that's smoke, or here's when the fire started, and here's the image before the fire started. And they would label all of that data, tediously, tediously done by University of San Diego, um, uh, UCSD. Tedious work, volunteers labeling those images, and then feeding that into a model which could uh, um, uh, slowly improve over time. And we were fortunate enough to, this is an infrared camera, this is a, a regular camera, we're fortunate enough to, uh, when there was a controlled burn at a prairie, that we could set up a node and get real live data from the controlled burn, meaning they, they were going to burn this prairie anyway. And when they lit fire to it, uh, we were there catching uh, catching data, right? So this is what you know life was like uh, in 2023, um, and but the world is getting turned on its edge, as you know, with ChatGPT and Mistral and uh, uh, and other large models, Gemini, is that they're not just being designed for the supercomputer. So this is a paper that that DeepMind published. Um, for Gemini, and it notice it says a family of high ca highly capable multimodal models. Multimodal meaning it isn't just text; it's not just a chat bot, but there's audio, uh, there's there's video, there's uh, image data and text. So this is a paper describing their model. But if you look here, this is a very interesting clue as to what's happening in the world, right? So in addition to this gigantic cloud-based, you know, where everyone is chatting and, and opening a window and talking to the, the model, they've designed a version of that model, which is so small that it fits on a phone. It's four bit quantized and fits on a phone. Now this is where the world has moved, which is my phone can translate languages, right? Even without a cell signal, because the AI model is running in my phone. It is true edge computing. So the models may be built with $100 million supercomputers, but they can be quantized and shrunk down to live at the edge. Now, this is a different strategy than this, right? So this is the way we've been doing projects, right? Where you, you get specific training images, 
you label them, you laboriously work through the data, you design algorithms, you tweak the model specifically for a single task. In this world, you're training on everything, the entire planet, right? And of course, we know that there are copyright and licensing issues with, with these approaches, but this model can be built that is enormous and multimodal. And now the question is, well, how does that perform compared to these models, which we built by hand? Now, this is an open science question. And uh, this is an example of us exploring that open science question. Here on the left is uh, one of the cameras looking at uh, some wildfire, some smoke. It's actually not wildfire, some smoke in uh, from a fire in uh, Oregon. But it's a controlled burn, and you can see these little dots here where the infrared shows the, the fire. But these images down here are from other cameras, and this in red is actually a fire. Now, how do you tell the difference between that and a cloud? Uh, you know, can a human tell the difference? If we look at that, is that a cloud or is that a fire? What about this? Okay, well, that's that's obviously a fire, right? But this is the how hard the problem is. But here's now the, the, the research question about what's happening with these large language models. I took this image and I dropped it into my laptop running a, a large language model. And so here I'm running just the standard 13 billion parameter. Uh, the, this thing happened to be, you know, two bit quantized, right? So that's, that's too small, uh, but that's fine. I drop it in. And I just ask the model, now this is running locally on my laptop, right? I just ask the model, hey, what's happening? And here you see the image shows a fire burning on a mountainside with billowing smoke in the sky. The scene appears to be captured from two perspectives. One's an infrared view. Wow, it figured out that it's an infrared camera. Uh, and one's a regular photo. Uh, there's a fire, right? So this is anecdotal science, right? I've tried one image here. But we've been doing this now for some time and it leads to this future that i'm excited to talk to discover us about is we're as we move ai out to the edge we've been building these these very bespoke specialized models what is the future when we are building and moving large language models out to the edge and we can do this now and we have done this as an experiment on our system on Sage. This one is even more fascinating. So this was actually a four bit quantized model now. Um, but look at that picture. That is a is a is a fire, right? So this is as a I used to live in New Mexico and and uh, our town burned uh, part of that town burned from a wildfire. So I'm well familiar with with what this looks like uh, in real life. And this kind of uh, image here right here is not a cloud. That's a fire. And we drop this in, this large language model, and immediately we see, wow, at least for the large language model, again, this is anecdotal because it's one example, but we need to work on the AI trustworthiness problem of what's possible, what is actually possible as we start running these large language models out at the edge. And again, here are bespoke models that we've been using, meaning a student or a postdoc worked on a very specific model to work on measuring snow depth or water depth. And, you know, here's another bespoke model measuring or uh, trying to uh, discover what water is on a, on a uh, park and a field. Um, but if you look here, you know, this is what's happening in our urban environment. Can we get to the point where large language models are doing this for us at the edge? Can we actually write programs that are prompts? So this is an example. You know, this image, I, again, I asked, uh, please describe this image, right? And it shows that, okay, it's identified water. Now, we, it's not quite as sophisticated yet as calculating its depth. Uh, but it's pretty clear that this is a way we're going to get at adding uh, intelligence to instruments by using large language models. Now, of course, the, the, all of the interfaces for using AI at the edge are still open in our plan and in our work. Um, this is an example. This was done a couple of years ago now uh, where students used 
AI at the edge to determine which direction are pedestrians going across the street. Are they going away from the camera or toward the camera? So that's blue or red in this case. And uh, where do they walk? Do they walk on the crosswalk right here, right? Which is uh, where you're supposed to walk or do they cut diagonally? Or do they go down to here and walk across, right? And so uh, you can plot all of this data. And the, the wonderful thing is that this allows for privacy preserving calculations about things like traffic or pedestrian flow or usage, because you're not saving all of the images. You're not recording what people are doing. Instead, you're doing a calculation about their position and then throwing the data away, right? So this was undergrad research using these kinds of concepts and using Sage in these tools. Now I wanna talk about another example. Um, this one is uh, uh, near from a park nearby. Um, one of the things that scientists, we talked about atmospheric scientists uh, and wildfire, um, but one of the things that biologists are interested in is biodiversity. So again, how can we use AI pushed out to the edge to help with biodiversity. Well, this is a park um, and here are some uh, uh, places that we can uh, monitor with devices and get recordings and process that data. Um, now, one of the difficulties is, remember I mentioned that for wildfire, you have a human who has to, you know, look at every image and say fire, not fire, and tag it and label it. But we can actually use new techniques called self-supervised learning that looks for patterns and, and uh, groupings and clusters and learns what these are itself. Now, you still need a human to say, oh, that particular group of bird song, as an example, that's a you know common yellow throat or a red-winged blackbird. Um, that part is the last bit, but all the labeling doesn't need to be done if if we can make advancements in self-supervised learning. Now, this is, again, an active research area, uh, and but it has shown tremendous promise. And so this is an example from a paper from one of the postdocs, Dario, um, where all of these, of course, later a human says, oh, that bird song is a blue jay or that's an indigo bunting. But the actual grouping of finding that self-similar call, whether it's insects or blue jay, happens automatically without labeling, having to have a human listen to each sample. So what that lets us do uh, is something exciting like this. So this is a, uh, I mentioned that tower in Illinois over here. So this tower is at a special um a uh, place where there's, uh, it's a wetland where it's near a river and there are a lot of migrating birds who come and go in that area. And this particular uh, tower right here is solar powered and there's a little hut there. And we have, of course, a GPU in there running these AI algorithms. And here we have several days, uh, you know, almost a week here of data where we're recording at this, at this uh, refuge. And this is when the sun comes up and when the sun goes down and you can see the lull in activity over the night. But you can also see that, especially around here, some birds start uh, chirping at, at 3 or 4 a.m. But also at night, uh, at 3 a.m., you might have something like the great horned owl uh, 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 calling out, right, uh, and making their vocalization. So this kind of computation, which is processing all of the data live and giving this live stream on a website so that the data is not sending all the recordings back, it's processing it and sending back all this data is then a live measure of biodiversity. When does this species show up? When does it leave? Um, uh, how, uh, how active is it? Um, and we have not yet gotten to the point of, of separating the kinds of bird calls. You know that birds have a, you know, maybe a happy call and a uh, warning call or, or a mating call. And so the future of AI is to be able to process those kinds of things pushed out to the edge. Now, 
again, another we we're using a model that came from comes from Cornell. Uh, they're sort of the world experts in the U.S. Uh, um, uh, for bird for ornithology. We're using their model for identifying uh, birds, but we can detect already, even in our recordings, like when it rains and certain kinds of insects, uh, very periodic, like crickets or, or cicada. So um, we know that this is the future for measuring uh, biodiversity. Uh, and now let me go on to say just a couple more examples and uh, uh, we'll start uh, wrapping up. So. Again, here's another example where students have written code. They can process this code. And this is a very simple one. You can see here on the left that the street is not yet safe for driving. It's in the middle of the night, it's snowing, and the road is still covered in snow. And then later after the snow plows have been through, uh, you can see that it's better and here's a car. And then finally uh, later, um, sun has come out, uh, maybe it's a, another month of uh, sunshine and everything's dry. Uh, and the point here is that things like this are, 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 possi are made possible because we can write algorithms and process those algorithms uh, um, on the edge and students are able to do this. Uh, and again, you can write this in a privacy preserving way. Now, I mentioned that one of the unique uh, use cases was connecting uh, edge to HPC and I'll say digital twins. So this is a project that's on the island of Nantucket. Nantucket is, is part of Cape Cod. Uh, it's in Massachusetts. Uh, it's a very rustic uh, uh, island um, off the coast. You have to take a ferry uh, or, a, or a plane to get there. And there are wind farms that are going up in Nantucket off the coast. And this LIDAR is a hundred plus thousand dollar LIDAR. It's very expensive, but it can be steered to look at particular phenomenon uh, in real time. Now, in the past, a human would say, oh, that might be interesting. I'll look over there. I'll look over there. But by using AI at the edge, by shoving these algorithms into these containers on Sage, again, we don't make sensors, we just plug them in. So here they have plugged into this, this uh, computing box, which has a GPU in it, this $100,000 LiDAR. And now the LiDAR can look and calculate based on the Sage node, where's the most turbulent, interesting part of the wind near these 3D, near these turbines, right? Near these wind farms. And then it can steer the LiDAR to specifically probe in, in higher resolution that area. And so then that can be used to update the digital twin, right? Which is a, a model of how the how atmospheric conditions evolve and what the model in terms of CFD, what that's going to do with, um, with wind turbines off the coast, right? How does that change uh, the flow of air? So these things can be done in the small, you know, the bird song, right? Where it's returning a particular bird, or I'll say in the continuum where it's actually linked and running into an HPC algorithm so that you can update uh, the data for a digital twin. Now, we're kind of uh, um, at the point of, well, where would our imagination take us, right? Uh, I mentioned all the things that students have written and postdocs have written. But there are a lot of other ideas that people have had, but they haven't had time to explore. And so we're excited if if we find collaborators that can uh, um, that are excited about pursuing some of these. So I'll give you some examples. So we do have someone working on automatically steering the cameras, these steerable cameras, based on some local AI to dis to look at what is uh, interesting, right? So you can imagine. You see a, 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 an animal or a, a part of the scene that has changed that was never like that before. How would you write a piece of code that automatically moves the camera and zooms in to get more training data, right? Measuring vegetative states and flower uh, times, uh, calculating biodiversity, I mentioned. Um, tracking wildlife in open fields, understanding their movements. Uh, measuring a uh, water flow based on only on the camera. Now the U.S. Uh, geological 
Psychological Survey and the U.S. Forest Service are very interested in this. There, it's very easy to, to put a camera looking at a small creek. It's very complicated to try and put an instrument in the creek to measure the flow. That's a very mechanical process. Uh, it gets fouled all the time. You need a human to go out and clear things because you're touching the water. The water levels go up and down. Uh, leaves and sticks come through. It's 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 very very difficult. A camera which watches the waves and the debris could calculate water flow. Um, we've had folks ask us, well. Um, we're interested in understanding bike usage, and particularly our people who use the shared bikes, which many cities have, do they wear helmets? Do they bring their own helmets? These are questions, again, that can be asked in a privacy-preserving way by allowing the AI to detect and then throw the image away and report only the uh, uh, the result, right? We also have questions about measuring rime ice, which is on instruments uh, up in the mountains uh, and uh, uh, measuring lightning uh, with RF and so forth. So uh, we also have the problems though of being responsible and trustworthy. So uh, this is a little bit of a joke, uh, but I have, uh, taken an image from Chicago. This is actually an image from the city of Chicago. And I've taken it and put it into a program and said, add three things. Now, uh, I, I'm going to give you a moment here to try and look. I think you can certainly find one thing which the computer has added, which is not really there uh, in Chicago. Um, but the other two might be more difficult to choose and to find. Um, so uh, if you're if you're in the chat and you think you have the answer, uh, um, you know, please go ahead and and type it in. If you think you know what is absolutely positively the computer added that it's a hallucination, it's false. So uh, any any uh, takers on on that? Maybe the, the horses in the middle? So the horses for sure, yes, the horses for sure. <laughs> but there's two others that I've added. And the, the wheelchair? So the wheelchair is added, yes, very good, very good eye. Yeah, also in the chat, the word the same <laughs> ideas, yes. So the, the, the third one uh, that was added was the motorcycle rider. So that's also, uh, I'll say, you know, uh, fake. It was, it was added. Now, um, uh, I bring this up because when, as we're pushing AI everywhere, I mean, we know this with ChatGPT, with Mistral, with uh, um, Gemini, the questions of trustworthy and validity are there. But as we push this AI into scientific instruments, now we we want to be really sure about our science, right? We want to really understand what are the limitations. And if it's misused, what could that uh, represent? So we have safety and ethics questions. Could someone write a piece of code that lives at the edge that reports um, uh, uh, scientific data incorrectly, maybe incorrectly on purpose? Uh, can they could they cause a model to hallucinate, right? So these are all open questions as, as we look at the computing continuum, uh, we, we, there's a rich, rich area for scientific discovery, but we have to also put on our, our, our careful uh, science skeptic hat and make sure that we are trustworthy and that we can continue to preserve privacy. Now, uh, just a couple notes. Um, uh, these are uh, slides from from Rick and others. As as mentioned, Mistral, OpenAI, Gemini. These are moving toward extraordinarily powerful, but fewer models. Right. So uh, these bespoke models, like I mentioned for for wildfire, there they'll still be those, but these really powerful, rich, large models are are going to continue to evolve. And we're going to continue to see taking what we would call this foundation model for science and moving into questions like uh, automatically captioning images, finding things, following instructions, programming, answering questions, 
uh, even asking, I'll say sentiment analysis, but we've been exploring asking questions like, uh, for example, in an image, is there something dangerous happening, right? Now we can lead questions like, is it is there flooding? Is there wildfire? But we might eventually get to, you know, what's the probability of uh, something happening, right? These are the kinds of questions that these big, large models will continue to advance at. And, uh, we, you know, we see that there's an explosion of, of model development. Uh, you know, it isn't just one model. It isn't just one company everywhere in Europe, in, uh, in, in Asia, uh, in Japan, in Korea, there are uh, in the Middle East, uh, in the United Arab Emirates, people are are building and fielding these large models, and they're getting to the largest computing possible. You know, we we think of an exaflop day, right? And we're very close to having we have exascale systems at Argonne, an exaflop day of requiring to calculate these things. And we also know that, you know, while we started the world with chat right in these large language models that's that's over there there will not not be any more models that are pure chat all of the big models now benefit from being what we call multimodal and uh i i talked to a researcher from uh the allen institute uh, who's working on ai and they said we've also stopped using the word large you know, it doesn't make sense to say large language model. Um, it's just a, it's it's just an AI model, and they will not just be language. They'll be, you know, audio and video and uh, hyperspectral and everything else. So this trend is going to continue. We're going to continue having these kind of models. And from a science perspective, now talking about the continuum and edge and uh, working with Discover US and others. We're very excited about the idea of what, where might we apply and build new models? Where might we put them? How might we get students on them? And so there are many collaboration opportunities. So uh, uh, first, we've been doing these end-to-end -end workflows. We've started that work with Pegasus, which is a project in the U.S., but that kind of connecting to what, what sometimes people refer to as now casting. So that's that digital twin of computing in real time based on data that's coming from the edge. Uh, expanding for other places. We work with a, a indigenous uh, uh, community, the Ojibwe tribe uh, in Wisconsin. Um, and we are want to continue expanding to uh, a variety of communities and people. Um, Understanding large language models and self-supervised learning. These are very good topics for us. Uh, um, understanding how we connect up with other resources, right? Whether that's supercomputer resources or alert resources. Collaborating on AI safety. Um, and then students, right? Everything from we have LoRaWAN and other things hooked into Sage already. Uh, and putting that stuff together. I mentioned that one of the groups has already uh, wired in a tree sap monitor, so there it is. Um, and so there are a lot of opportunities for us to collaborate uh, and to look at how to build systems where AI uh, and students and postdocs uh, can, can work toward new discoveries. So uh, I'm happy to uh, collaborate and our team is uh, at Northwestern. Uh, and at Argonne, but uh, um, we're very happy to, and and later at your meeting, Nicola Ferrier, who's the uh, deputy director for the SAGE project, will be uh, will be there and be able to present. So uh, I'll stop sharing uh, uh, for a moment and say, well, I think we have time for for questions. Sorry, I didn't have the Q&A up earlier. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do that. Thank you, Pete. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Um, yeah, I see a question already from Dan. Um, so yeah, that's a great. I that's a great question. Let me let me. Uh, it's not a quick answer, but let me let me mention that. So um, you know, whenever we have a new instrument, uh, um, you know, a new thermometer, a new three uh, uh, D wind speed, um, we have a, a kind of a, a waterfall. Uh, I mean, rain sensor that's that's optical, right? That measures the water droplets that hit have hit a dome. Right. Whenever those um, are developed, uh, the way we prove their their I'll say their correctness is with very large data sets. 
So I'll give just the, the optical, I don't have it in my office here. Um, I wish I did, but um, the optical uh, rain gauge, right? So this is a hundred dollar item. Uh, uh, as I said, it has a little camera, it has a little plastic dome and it measures the ref reflectivity, refraction of water droplets hitting there. And it calculates how much water has fallen. Now that device, a company makes and they bought, they sell it and it tells you the rain. It is in compare, you can compare that to what's called a tipping bucket. You know, water fills up in a little flask, tips over and water fills up again and tips over and water fills up again and tips over, right? So the way we handle explainability and correctness is the same, which is that these new devices, whether it's optical or it's AI, have to be measured against standardized means and that a wide distribution uh, uh um you know statistical distribution of data have to be represented and measured so what we have to do as a community is come up with those test cases to measure and be able to show that the performance of the model in this bound of statistical data is correct right and so uh, we can't short circuit that we can't avoid that we have to tackle that as a part of trustworthiness is to build that whole framework of how to test and verify output without having to look inside in the same way that we're not looking inside uh any of these other instruments we purchase but we're going to have to look at its results um so uh rosa asked uh can you describe a bit more about what's needed to deploy the Sage platform? Very, very good question. So uh, the least or, or the easiest way is to simply provide uh, um, networking and electrical power. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's all you need. So uh, um, we do have areas that are solar powered, but that's expensive. Uh, you know, in the U.S., a small solar uh, powered setup for Hawaii for this is for that Maui example, it's, you know, 25K, uh, $25,000, right, to do that with batteries and solar. So if there's electrical power um, uh, and you have a, a cell phone network, uh, that's all that's needed uh, to deploy it. Now, what it, what does it do? We even also have a, a Starlink uh, configuration in Montana uh, um, and so, and also other places. So uh, what does it do? Well, the network contacts the cloud and then uh, projects are given space on the Sage website to create their project and start running applications, write their own applications and run them at the edge. Um, so that's what's, now if you have an indoor hut, let's say, uh, you know, uh, then all you need is a rack, uh, I mean, a, a, a 2U or whatever server and any x86 server will do. Uh, and you could put all your instruments outside and just run the power over ethernet instruments into the hut. You don't need to put our device outside. You can run it in the hut and then it's even easier because it's just a software, uh, I'll say a software solution. So Eduardo asked the question, uh, has the increase in GPU price influ inc influenced the course? <laughs> yes, um, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, also, you know, the, the, the thing that's happening though is all of the vendors are realizing that the, you know, it's kind of like the difference between um, uh, ARM and Intel. So, you know, ARM, which is the CPU, you know, the technology used inside our cell phones, they sell billions and billions of phones. And so their markup can be pretty small, right? For the really large servers, they don't sell as many and their markup, their, their profit is, is huge. So we're kind of though in a little bit of a good state, which is that this edge where smaller 10, 20, 30, 40 watt devices are going to live, that's not where the incredible markups of profit are happening. Right now those markets profit markups are happening uh, and the big machines where OpenAI has more money than they know what to do with, right? And Microsoft has more money than they can possibly you know, buy. So, so that's where the prices are. So we're kind of lucky in, in the edge space. Uh, uh, Francesca asked about the privacy and data collected. Uh, do you have a mechanism that ensures the images are not moved away? So yes, absolutely. That's a very good question. We have two things that happen. So one is um, uh, the, I'll say the owner of the 
where the device is put has to enable by signing you know up and saying I want to any devices to to any images to leave the node. So for example, sometimes we set up a node in my office um, because it's being tested. Well, there should not be any images of me in my office that that are leaving the node, right? That's that's forbidden. Um, on the other hand, there are nodes that are on mountaintops and people say, hey, uh, we're, we can stream images from the mountaintop all day. Other times we're in a city and we have a, a responsibility. The city says, here are the rules for the way our city operates. So yes, all of those uh, policies can be baked in to how the, the node runs. Um, oh, there was a question here about the uh, basic, uh, um, what's the basic cost? Uh, that's a, a good question. So um, the the basic cost of the outdoor sized box, right, um, which we called the Wild Sage node, is about 10 to 15K, depending on how many sensors get plugged in. And that's really the the cost here is those those cameras and and other things, microphone, um, the LIDAR. There's also a tiny little LIDAR, like from a, a car that we've used, um, other things. Um, and the power is uh, based on actually how many GPUs you put in the box. So 30, 50 watts, you know, 60 watts is possible, but there are some projects who have doubled up and added more GPUs into the box because they have, you know, a LiDAR and a camera and something else. They want to process all of it. Um, uh, Dimitra uh, asked, I uh, um, hope the recording video is available. Yes, I think that's going to be happen. Uh, I also understand underlying optimization problems, all these edge solutions. Yes, energy consumption. Let, let's talk about that. Um, that's a big one, you know, especially for the solar power one. So one of the things we did was, uh, we added a sensor to the solar controller back into the node. So now if you wanted to write code, which automatically controlled what the scheduler and what computing you did at the edge based on how much battery and solar was available, you could write that code because we've we've hooked a, a control line back uh, uh, in. Um, so uh, so that certainly is possible. But we are looking at at, you know, how do we make these even more energy efficient? And there are versions that some companies have made that are sort of battery powered. We are using LoRaWAN for things that can be buried in the ground uh, um, and measure soil moisture. So uh, um, I'll pause there. Is there are there other live questions or other questions people have? Um, I have myself a question on um, how you manage uh, our orchestrate all the these deployments. I mean, if, for example, uh, remember you show me sometimes the portal, not the stage. Uh, if there are many users that want to deploy your application, how do you, do you have an internal scheduler, I guess, no? That decides yes, who goes yes. first, because again, there's a limited capacity, no? Yeah, so um, I will, uh, uh, just one second here. Um, uh, oops. There we go. Let me do a, uh, a very quick uh, screen share. So for folks who, uh, uh, who want to explore, um, this is the basic web page, um, Sage Continuum. But if you go here to the portal, uh, as was just refer referred, then um, here you see, you know, actual nodes. And, you know, I was talking about a node in Montana. You can go and look at this node in Montana. And here you can see, you know, the actual jobs, I'll say the jobs that are running, right? So this is the wildfire smoke detection. And we're hoping that uh, there's no wildfires right now. So you could, you could go and you could click and, you know, thankfully it's zero <laughs> right here. Uh, but uh, uh, but we could go and look at the bird monitoring, for example, and we could uh, look in here and see what kinds of birds it's hearing and uh, you know what bird this is. Uh, uh, and we can look at other other data again running at the edge. Uh, this is running you know every every hour. so it's not running, we don't have it running continuously. Um, 
And uh, these are images uh, that are that are coming uh, off, uh, and I have permission to use this because it's in a rural area, so we can look out the camera. It looks like something has fouled the lens here, so uh, there might be a bug or something that's uh, stuck on there. We have to wait for a rainstorm. Um, and so you can go up here uh, also to the uh, app catalog, and these are all the the jobs that people have written, all the code that people have written. But uh, we can also um, uh, go here to sensors. And again, we don't make sensors, but this is the place where all these different things have been integrated. So people have integrated this, you know, this kind of microphone or this accelerometer or, or uh, uh, this dome camera or the sap flow meter, right? So uh, again, you can think of this as a, as a computing element uh, remote uh, that you can uh, interact with and write code for, and you can browse and query the data. And uh, one of the things, uh, just so you know, in the data query is that everything is very easy to grab with just a curl. So, uh, or if you want to use Python, uh, uh, you can just cut and paste that code, cut that out here, and that will give you the answer you know, to this data here. So that data here, you can be, you can look at it and say, ah, oh, that's where it comes from and, and what that data is. And you can search particular nodes and then pull that, pull that data down. Um, so anyway, uh, that, uh, it, so, so projects get a, a space in that, uh, uh, in that portal and, uh, and run there. Okay. Thank you. So I don't know if we have, uh, I think there is another question in the Q&A. How do you handle the verbose outputs of using oh, LLMs? Oh, yeah, yeah, edge? good question. <laughs> good, good, no, very, very good question. So let me answer that real quick. Um, so yes, that I gave you an example of asking an LLM and they, you know, again, if you don't prompt them well, they also give you uh, crazy answers. So I'll just give you a quick example. You know, if I look at, we were analyzing clouds, if I say, you know, describe the sky, um, the models are often biased toward happy. <laughs> so so um, you'll get answers like, oh, it's a beautiful day. It, it's, you know, you should listen to music and the clouds are, you know, uh, drifting across the sky. But if you say, I'm an atmospheric scientist, I'm studying stratocumulus and this kind of cloud, please describe the atmospheric conditions, then you get a, a very uh, detailed output. Now, how do you how do you handle that that output? So, a couple things. A lot of the models allow you to specify the grammar that the answer can come back in. So, it's possible to even tell the large language model, "Give me a one if it's wildfire. Give me a zero if it's not." Right, and and no other. So, just the 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 prompt is just returning one zero one zero 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 one. Right. You can also say, here's an ontology and give all of the answers using these tokens or this description or this JSON. So there are ways to control that and manage that in the models. Um, but it is, it's very important because uh, then you're just, if you don't do that, you're left writing another parser to parse the output of, of the, the large language model. Okay. Okay, so I think we don't have more questions. So I think we are also on time. So thank you, Pete. Thank you very much for your uh, availability today and your great presentation. Um, uh, thank you for all the assistance for the participants and for your numerous questions as well. Uh, I think that we can can close uh, here the the webinar, and uh, so mm, you are invited to join the the next webinar of Discovery Voice. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you very much.